that's what we want to talk about today is, you know, the patient who is snoring or has obstructive sleep apnea or hates their CPAP or refuses to ever be tested because they don't they know they don't want a CPAP. <laughs> They'd rather die than have a CPAP. So they're not even going to get a sleep study. Um, so let's talk about that patient. So how do you guys think about these patients when they're presenting in your office? How does that look? Well, you know, I've, I've been at it a little bit longer, and and so I think back, if we had recorded this, if there was such a thing as podcast 10 or 15 years ago, I guess they were just starting, you know, and you asked me, do you do sleep in your practice? I would have said, absolutely. But what I meant back then is I saw snoring patients and I triaged them. So usually those patients are dragged in by their bed partner, by their ear or their collar and thrown into my chair, and, and I'm told to fix them. And so what we would do is send them elsewhere for a sleep study. And many times we would never see them again, or perhaps we would get them back to discuss the sleep study, but that was interpreted by somebody else. And then maybe we would write a CPAP prescription or, or discuss other treatment options. And so over that 10 or 15 years, that's completely changed in my practice, at least, where we first brought the diagnostics in-house and began doing home sleep testing. We in my practice currently use the, the watch pad test from Zoll Itamar, and we've used that for eight or nine years. There are many other good ones on the market. And that we went along well for a couple of years and, and noticed that patients love that. They love being able to stay with their initial physician for the diagnosis and the discussion of treatment options. But even then, I would either write a CPAP prescription or discuss an oral appliance. These were in the days where Inspire was really just coming to market and other surgical options were real desirable for patients. And admittedly, Ashwin, we were not thinking about the nose with regards to sleep. At least I wasn't, and we weren't having the discussions that thankfully we do now. And so that Next step was bringing the oral appliance program into our office. And what I mean by that is here in Dallas, we had for decades referred to a sleep dentist in our geographic area. But just that drive from my office to the dentist completely changed the economics for the patient. So once I was able to bring the dentist into my office, I was able to run those appliances through the patient's health insurance. And so maybe if I had 10 patients before that I thought an oral appliance might be a good alternative to CPAP, maybe one of them would actually follow through because it was quite expensive. It was out of network or completely cash pay. But just having the dentist in my office, we've moved that up to maybe six or seven out of 10 that I feel are good candidates for oral appliances or actually receiving them. And oh, by the way, saving a lot of money in doing so. So that was really uh, step two. And relatively recently for me, Ashwin, I, I do hope you talk a lot about your Inspire experience as well. Two of my younger associates are doing the Inspire implant. And we're, as people told me uh, for a while, we've been amazed at how many candidates there are, but also how much interest there is. And, and I would say kudos to Inspire for raising so much awareness that there are alternatives to CPAP. If that's just not for you, you don't have to just live and slash die from a untreated obstructive sleep apnea. You actually have other options. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you said. I have much more limited experience in practice than you, so I haven't seen the evolution, but I've seen everything you say come through, come true. So if you can bring some of the diagnostics in-house and as many treatment options as you can offer in-house, then that patient will stay with you and you'll be able to follow them along as a journey to take care of their sleep and their health, really. Patients love it. They love having a one-stop shop. I mean, you're, you're really uh, unique and a great in that you know so much, you're boarded in so much about sleep. I mean, patients can, no matter what, I mean, they can stay with you for their entire treatment. And I will... Now, I just think it's important to say, I mean, I know that we have a variety of listeners, but a lot are otolaryngologists and all three of us are. It's always amazed me, even as a resident, that we aren't the primary specialty that treats sleep apnea. So this is a disease that occurs right here. 
And yet it's treated by the doctors of the brain and the doctors of the lungs. And that's, they do a wonderful job. That's not a knock on the pulmonologists and the neurologists. It's a knock on our society that we didn't take this by the reins and really drive therapy and treatment. And so I'm, I'm glad to see that there is much more interest amongst our colleagues in doing so finally. I think that OSA is a field with a fellowship behind it. That's a sleep fellowship. But even with the sleep fellowship, OSA is going to be 90% plus of what a sleep physician is treating. And OSA is an upper airway disorder. Your brain is telling you to breathe. Your diaphragm is trying to bring air into your lungs and there's obstruction in the upper airway. And we're biased. We're all biased. But uh, nobody knows that better than us than knows the pharynx, the larynx, and the upper airway. is uh, It's our wheelhouse. So understanding that you can impact an OSA patient more meaningfully than a lot of physicians who do sleep medicine can is really important. And I feel that all otolaryngologists, whether they want to be or not, are probably really good sleep doctors for OSA. Another thing I'll say, and, and you highlighted it with the Inspire comment, is that when a patient sees a sleep physician who is not a surgeon, there's really only one answer, and that answer is CPAP. And a lot of patients will pick up on that. And eventually, patient says, the CPAP's really bothering me. I don't like it. It's blowing in my face. It's waking me up. I hate it. And the doctor says, yeah, you know, you need to wear your CPAP or we'll try on BiPAP or we'll try a different mask. And then the patient comes back and maybe it's a little better, maybe it's not. And the doctor says, well, yeah, you really need to wear it. You're going to die if you don't wear it. And at some point that patient will become cognizant of the fact that there's only one tool in the toolbox there. And that patient will put the CPAP under their bed or they'll get rid of it or their insurance will reclaim it because they're not using it. And what I've seen in, in my couple years of practice is that there are so many of those people out there that have put OSA treatment, they've forgotten about it and they're sleeping in a different room as their bed partner or they're, they're yeah. suffering. They've developed atrial fibrillation. It drives me crazy, right? Yeah. Because I, I see this, you know, snoring is a, a frequent topic of comedy routines, right? But it's not funny. I, this is the most severe disease that an otolaryngologist takes care of, except for head and neck cancer. And we're only really treating about 1% of patients longer than 90 days that have OSA. 1%? 1? One? The quarter of this planet, 25% of this planet is walking around with diagnosable OSA. I'm just talking about OSA here. Of that, even in the Western world, we have only diagnosed 10% of people that have OSA. Of that 10%, we're only treating 10% longer than 90 days. So yes, Ashley, if my math is right, it's 1%. <laughs> Imagine if we were treating 1% of head and neck cancers. That's what we're doing with this. And it's just as morbid and it's just as fatal. Maybe not as quick as a bad laryngeal you know, squamous cell, but just as fatal eventually.